We move now to the question to the Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development. I, before I call Mr. Alban McGuinness, I must inform the members that question 14 has been withdrawn. Mr. McGuinness. Number one, Principal Deputy Speaker. I and my officials have been part of numerous missions um, to non-EU countries aimed at gaining access to markets and promoting our high-quality agricultural commodities. China is a key market for a range of commodities from the north. I have twice visited there to build um, the important high-level relationships that are needed to agree terms of trade. In addition, my veterinary officials have visited China on eight occasions since 2012. Officials have also supported inward inspections by the Chinese authorities, where we were able to showcase our excellent pig health standards and secure approval for us to export pig semen. We have also agreed terms to export horses to China through these visits. I am hoping for similar success for pork exports following the Chinese mission we will host in the coming months. Other key markets for pork include Australia, and I was pleased when my officials, having met with their Australian counterparts, in June 2014, we were able to secure agreement for an inward mission. This is scheduled for mid-2015 and will offer us the opportunity to show first-hand our excellent um, production standards and high-quality produce. My officials also supported an inspection by the US authorities in 2014, which allowed us to maintain our approval to export pork there. For the beef sector, my officials secured, an access, secured access to the Singapore market after hosting a very successful mission in 2013. A visit by my official to Japan has also resulted in them agreeing to initiate negotiations of beef exports. One of my officials has recently visited um, the Philippines to promote their high quality beef production standards and again to hopefully secure an inward inspection um, of our processors. We are also preparing to host a beef and lamb mission by the US in 2015. Call Mr McGuinness for supplementary. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her detailed reply and, uh, and welcome the progress that has been made, uh, particularly in relation to China. Um, and indeed, I attended a meeting recently in which the uh, Chinese Consul General attended, uh, and certainly there is great potential there. But could I ask the uh, Minister in relation to uh, export licenses uh, issued by DEFRA. Uh, how much progress has there been made in relation to export licenses? Um, can I say, just um, I've also met with the Consul General and um, look forward to establishing um, good links with her in terms of um, any assistance which she has um, absolutely offered to provide us uh, in reaching into new markets um, right across China. Uh, in terms of the export certificates, we've got a very strong um, working relationship with DEFRA. Obviously, um, DEFRA are in the lead in terms of international relations, but we have a very, very strong working group in place, which um, helps us um, in terms of identifying the priority areas for industry here. And then, obviously, we can um, have those discussions with DEFRA around potential visits, around securing um, inspections, which all obviously lead to us to secure um, new markets. So quite a strong relationship there when it's an ongoing relationship because we're continually looking for and identifying new markets and it's important that we keep our eye on the ball in terms of potential possibilities that there are for the local industry. Well, Ms. Sandra Overhead. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And I may need to declare an interest being the wife of a pig farmer. Uh, but can the minister provide an update on the inspection visit of the, the Chinese veterinary officials in regards to the possible exportation of pork uh, from Northern Ireland? I understand uh, that visit has been delayed twice. Uh, does the Minister accept um, that time is of the essence with regard uh, to the value of such export markets and does she accept that the Republic has been better than Northern Ireland in tapping into this market? I think that um, obviously we're disappointed that the Chinese officials have had to cancel the inspections on a number of occasions and we're continually engaging with them to make sure that happens. We've now been told that it will be over um, next month that the way we expect to have our inspection and, and we very much look forward to that. It is a, it's a key market for us, as I've said in the answer to the original question. It's a key market for us that we're um, fully exploring. I don't think that um, we we'll need to play what happens in the 6th against the 26th. We actually get, get into quite a lot of the same markets. Um, we actually work collaboratively, again, on a number of areas and a number of markets that we're trying to explore. It's um, of key importance to me that we open up every opportunity that um, 
my department's not found wanting in terms of our processes and I can, as I said in the original answer, all the markets that we're exploring, whether that be in China, whether it be the US, whether it be um, South Africa, um, the Philippines, all those markets that we're working with, they're all because the local industry have identified they're the markets that they want to target and um, we'll certainly be uh, working with them to make sure that we can access those markets as soon as we possibly can. But the, the um, issue of getting pork into China is, uh, is right up there in terms of my priority. And as I've said previously in the House, that once we have the inspection, if I think it's important politically for me to visit China, then I'm certainly going to do that to be able to try and open that market. Call Mr. Jim Allister. Just following up on that point, uh, and the uh, very disappointing delays in the Chinese inspection, might the answer not lie in better coordinating inspections in Northern Ireland with those governed by DEFRA in the rest of the United Kingdom? so that when the Chinese officials who have been months ago to GB and inspected, uh, why could you not have an arrangement whereby, under DEFRA, they come to Northern Ireland and also inspect here? Uh, is it a case that DARD's standing on its own dignity or something, whereas there's a far more important issue, getting the inspections over and done with? Um, the, the member party f works very hard to try and find a difference between my working relationship with DEFRA and DAFM in the 26 counties. But I said it originally, I said it to the original answer. We work very closely with DEFRA in terms of trying to open up new markets. DEFRA are the lead department in terms of opening up new markets. So it's vitally important that we work with the local industry here. We identify the markets. The Chinese market for pork is, in terms of our priorities, is right up there. The fact that the Chinese officials have cancelled has been disappointing for all of us. However, we don't have control over their dairies and how they conduct their business. For varying reasons, they've had to cancel their visit. And by extension, when they did visit um, England, they were to come here also. However, that didn't happen. But we are hopeful that that's going to happen over the next number of weeks. We are hopeful that we'll be able to um, further exploit the Chinese market for the local industry. And we will continue to work with DEFRA in terms of whatever is needed in, in, in making sure that we do open up the Chinese industry, the Chinese market for pork. Mr. Raymond McCartney is not in his place. I call Mr. Adrian McQuillan. Question number three, Principal Speaker. The rural network um, and the rural support networks facilitated the wider lag animation and information process, which commenced back in October 2014. Three to four meetings were held in each of the new council or lag area towards the end of last year. I have always wanted to get as many as, and as wide a spread of rural people involved in the wider lag as possible. I have also said up front that I wanted to see greater emphasis on engaging with young people and with women to get them onto the lags. To this end, two sector specific events aimed at encouraging membership from these sectors were also undertaken. As a result, over 2,000 people registered as wider lag members across the rural north. Some 70% of these members are new to lags, 41% are female, and the average age lies within the 40 to 49 age group. Each lag was then required to form uh, a board. All um, registered lag members were invited to, facilitate it, to a facilitated meeting of their lag for discussion and agreement on the arrangements for the selection of social partner composition on the lag board. Guidance was provided to, um, to the necessary balance and representation of the lag because of each of the area's geographic or each of the areas geography, gender, and age, and other Section 75 considerations. Members agreed their own composition requirements and were invited to nominate, including self-nomination, and vote for board membership. Nominations had to be supported by two other LAG members, <clears throat> and voting was undertaken in line with the LAG agreed criteria for that area. The social partner election has now taken place in every area, and those selected are now confirming their appointment. The establishment and election processes adopted by the new lags have been robust and have been transparent. The composition, the balance of each group will now be scrutinised by officials before drafting of the strategies begins. Well, Mr McQuillan for supplementary. Thank you, Principal Speaker. Can I thank the Minister for her answer so far? The Minister has also appointed the Rural Development Programme Morning Committee. And I notice uh, there's a lot of different groups on this uh, committee. Also, I notice that uh, one of the groups is the GAA. Will she consider appointing other groups to this committee, such as uh, Orange Order? Yes, we're very open to any group that represents the rural constituency coming forward. Whenever we, um, the, the stakeholder group that's in place is very important in terms of monitoring the outcomes and, and the work of the, the Rural Development Programme. So um, the board has been um, established. We've opened 
uh, for calls. Um, I don't believe the Orange Order came forward. However, I'm very open to any group that has an interest in rural communities is genuinely interested in protecting rural communities coming forward onto a stakeholder group. I call Mr. Ian Mill. I'd like to ask the Minister, when does the Minister anticipate that the new programme will open? Well, our programme is now being sent off to Europe and we expect about six months um, from when it was sent in. So we, we had expected initial correspondence um, over the last couple of months from sort of January, February time. However, that hasn't happened yet. So um, certainly by, by June time, we expect to have sign off from the Commission and then we're able to open up straight away. Well, we're hoping to actually open up maybe April, May time for um, animation works. And, and I encourage all groups that are interested in actually applying into the funding to watch out for, for that because it will be widely advertised in the press and on the DARD website. Um, for me, it is so important that we, get, um, that we hit the ground running, that we um, get funding on the ground as quickly as possible. We certainly can learn from um, our experience on the current programme and, and hopefully get off to, to a better start and a quicker start. Now that we have the lags in place, I think that we are well equipped to be able to do that. Call Mr. Colum Eastwood. Well, Deputy Speaker, and can thank the Minister for her, her answer thus far. Uh, can the Minister assure us that her department is continuously um, monitoring any issues pertinent to Section 75 to ensure that we have a, a proper uh, and full uh, account of people coming from all different parts of our society on these boards? Yes, as I said, the, the leader approach is very much a grassroots approach, it's very much a bottom up approach. It's the areas, the lag areas, deciding um, how. The, the groups will be constituted, however, very mindful of the, of the need to um, adhere to Section 75 considerations, and that was very much part of the discussion in forming these groups, uh, and, uh, and I'm in no doubt that that's actually what happened. My um, desire in this programme was to make sure we attracted more young people and more women to the groups because they were um, underrepresented. We have improved the situation somewhat, however, there's, there's still a way to go. Call Mr. Paul Frey. Number four, Mr. Davis Speaker. Accurate traceability of sheep is extremely important for animal disease control and for public health, and it's necessary to support trade in our sheep and sheep products. Theft and re-identification of sheep must be condemned, not only because of the effect on the keeper, whose livelihood is affected, but also because it undermines the future success of our sheep industry. Under European legislation, sheep must be identified with two identifiers bearing the same name, which have been approved by DARD. One of the identifiers must carry an electronic identification or an EID device. DART has approved a range of types of EID identifiers for sheep. This includes an EID ear tag, which is attached to the sheep's ear, and a ruminal um, EID bolus, which is inserted orally and remains in its stomach. While I do not propose to make the use of boluses compulsory, if a keeper is concerned about sheep theft, he or she may wish to consider applying a bolus. This may be an effective way to deter the theft of sheep, as boluses cannot be removed from a live animal. When a bolus is applied along, the second identifier, along with the second identifier in the form of an ear tag, the colour of that ear tag must be light blue to signify that the sheep is also carrying a bolus. This may itself help um, to deter theft. I do recognise the limitations of the use of these. Um, if a sheep has a two ear tags in place, markets and operators are not required to check whether a bolus is also present. However, if stolen sheep are traced by the police, the presence of any bolus may be of evidential value. Keepers who are particularly concerned about theft can also apply additional identification marks outside of the official identification system, which could maybe include tattoos and paint marking. Mr. Fraser, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Principal, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister what discussions she has had with DEFRA and, of course, with her neighbours in the Republic of Ireland around livestock theft? And can she tell us, tell us how, whether this problem is increasing or decreasing? I've had conversations with um, Simon Coveney through the North South Ministerial Council in relation to livestock theft and rural crime in general. Um, quite recently, there a number of weeks ago at the North South Ministerial Council, this was a, an item which we discussed uh, at some length. I think um, the member will be very aware that there are some areas that, um, where cattle theft is actually a lot more pronounced than others. Um, we've seen, for example, in the Glens of Antrim where there was a, a, a retinal scandal pilot that was run, we actually saw the figures coming down in the numbers of cattle theft, which was obviously a positive development. However, I, it's fair to say there's not a big demand for that type of technology. Um, so I think there's a, a, a different picture depending on, on different geographical areas. Certainly, 
rural crime, rural theft is the responsibility of DOJ, and I discussed with DOJ um, on not fairly ongoing basis as well, just um, how we can tackle that. From the department's point of view, obviously our enforcement team, our veterinary enforcement team, are working very um, clearly with um, the DOJ officials and the Garda Shikana around how we can tackle these issues head on. Well, Ms. Karen McKeva. Deputy Speaker, and I'm sure the Minister uh, will join with me in congratulating uh, Mary Mann, Colin McNally, on becoming the Young Engineer of the Year by designing um, uh, something to help prevent farm accidents. Just thought I'd take an opportunity. But also, uh, would the Minister enlighten the House uh, with, with the increase in farm theft in rural areas? Uh, what long term plans her department has to tackle uh, the theft of livestock and farm machinery? Yeah, yes, I can concur with your congratulations for um, the design which the, the young guy came up with um, for Platinum. Can I say in, in the longer term in relation to farm theft, obviously um, it's crime, it's an issue for the Department of Justice. However, my department work very closely with PSNI, with um, Garda Shiakana around um, tackling livestock theft, farm machinery theft, and whatever um, element we can get involved with, we're certainly up for doing that. In the longer term, I think that we can. From Dar's point of view, we can be a bit creative in terms of grant aid and, and items that we're awarding grant aid for. Could, um, for example, identification tags be part, but may be a must in terms of um, equipment that is possibly purchased. So there are a number of initiatives that we're looking at. But I think key to this is that there's cross-departmental work and cross-agency work, and, and we're up for that. I call Mr. Leslie Cree. Hi. The Forest Service is actively investigating the opportunities to exploit the forest estate for wind energy development. A wind energy development manager, seconded from the Strategic Investment Board, is progressing work on um, defining the wind farm programme and developing the necessary business case. So far, we have confirmed that there is an opportunity to develop um, this area at a strategic level and a strategic outline case to support this work um, was approved in November 2014. The next stages of investigation will inform the basis on which my department can anticipate revenues to be generated um, as the programme progresses. Clearly revenues will be dependent on the first sites becoming operational and we hope to see significant progress in that, in, in that regard over the next number of years. Alongside our programme for development of wind energy and force, Forest Service already has access arrangements in place <clears throat> for five wind farm projects taking place on land adjacent to forts. Um, over the past 10 years, this has realised about a half a million pounds. Well, Mr. Cree, for a supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy mm. Speaker. The Minister will know that this, um, at least one of the wind farms, is due to be in operation this year. The contingent action, in case it was delayed, was to sell timber from the Forest Service. Could the Minister tell us how much has been sold during the current year and if it will meet the budget? I don't have the figures in terms of um, the overall sales of Forest Service, but I'm happy to provide it to, to the member in writing. Um, suffice to say, um, Forest Service are an efficient operation and work within their budgets and are able to be self-sustaining in terms of the timber production that they have, but I'm happy to provide that figure in writing. I call Mr. Willie Irwin. Speaker, has the Minister ended the discussion with the NIE in regard to the difficulties in getting connections to wind farms? I know that he has already made representations in regard to that. Yeah, grid connections remain a significant constraint issue for connecting renewable energy projects regardless of the scale, so whether they're the big um, projects or the smaller ones. And that's causing um, particular um, issues, particularly for small scale generators, including turbines, but also for anaerobic digester facilities. Um, Larger scale developments like those proposed in Forest Service land tend to connect as part of a group or a cluster to which NIE would provide a transmission level voltage grid connection rather than a lower voltage connection. <clears throat> I know that um, there are ongoing concerns as, uh, um, as the member has highlighted in, re in relation to grid connections. My officials are continuing to engage with NIE, and, with NIE in relation to um, how those things can be improved. Call Mr Mickey Brady. I thank the Minister for answer so far. Can I ask the Minister how she will ensure that real community benefits are an integral part of this project? Yes, um, Forest Service has commissioned work to review and to report on the community participation and the benefits model that already exists in Ireland and other relevant jurisdictions and to test these models for use on Forest Service lands. 
Forest Service will present this information to community stakeholders in advance of wind farm plans coming forward. Responsibility for developing an action plan following on from the cross-departmental study on communities and renewable energy is a matter for DETI, but Forest Service is part of the group that's working on that. Suffice to say, for me, um, going forward, we have to exploit the maximum um, community benefits. That, and we're not, we need to be not talking about small-scale development. We need to be talking about real investment in rural areas, long-term sustainable investment in rural areas that really leads to a benefit. And for me, community um, participation, community involvement, and working up those plans well in advance of plan applications going forward and, and all the other works being progressed is key. And that's the only way in which, the only basis in which I would proceed in terms of taking forward wind farm development. Call Mr. Patsy McLeod. Um, I got a free last young colleague. My wee slash and Ida Sock and Fragri. Thanks very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answers. Uh, the Minister has indicated her support for five wind farm projects. Could you give us an indication as to where those are, please? The five wind farm projects I talked about are on land that is adjacent to Forest Service land, but I'm happy to, to give you the writing in writing um, the names of the five forests that are um, adjacent to, to where the wind farms are. Mr. Fergal McKinney is not in his place. I call Ms. Brenda Hale. Deputy Speaker, question seven. The maximising access in rural areas evaluation has been ongoing since this phase of, <clears throat> of the project commenced in 2012. The evaluation, which is both um, pro process and outcome focused, has been integrated into the implementation of the project from the outset. The process elements of the Mara project were evaluated and reported on early in 2013. The project implementation group implemented the report's recommendations, which enhanced various delivery aspects of the Mara project. Regarding the evaluation of outcomes from the project, household visits have been followed up with a questionnaire to a sample of individuals in each delivery zone um, to assess outcomes generated. Data collection is now complete and data is being analysed to examine the reach of Mara for key demographic groups, the level of referrals for grants, benefits and services and the resulting outcomes. In addition, an independent piece of work has been commissioned to review the evaluation currently undertaken by our delivery partners in the Public Health Agency. This will include an economic assessment, including a social return on investment on the project. The evaluation work is on schedule to be completed by the end of June 2015, and I look forward to sharing the evaluation to help inform how to tackle rural poverty and social isolation issues for the most vulnerable in society. Well, Mrs. Hale for supplementary. I thank the Minister for her answer, and I know that there's trained enablers are tra planning to visit up to 2,000 households this coming year, but is the Minister aware at the minute before the data is available if there are areas where Mara is not being accessed fully or where the take-up is indeed very low? It's something that we'd want to um, draw out from the analysis that has happened. Um, as far as I'm concerned, it's, it's right across the board. I don't think there's any areas where we're not reaching. However, um, I'm happy to, to write to the member whenever we have our full analysis, because that's obviously not... Um, the intention, if there's any areas where we're, perhaps we're not being as effective on the ground, then we need to address that. The fact that we have these rural enablers, that they are local people, that they know the areas that they're going into, I think, gives obviously the benef is a benefit to the programme. Um, so it's not my understanding that there are any areas that are left out, but if the member feels maybe there are, or could identify an area, I'm happy, very happy to take that on. Because as we roll out the new programme, we want to make sure that we plug any gaps that um, are identified because the benefits of this programme, are, are, even the early indication of benefits, are really fantastic. The numbers that have been reached, and we want to be able to build on that, it is a very positive piece of work. Call Mr. Cathal Boylan. Let me ask him, Boylan. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Could uh, the Minister outline how people have a benefit from the rollout of this project, Gourmet Market? Yes, yeah, since, um, since when it started back in 2002, almost 14,000 14, households have been visited. So. Um, that, that in itself speaks volumes in terms of the work that's being done by those people on the ground going door to door and actually working through applications with people. Um, some of the initial outcomes would suggest that um, over 1,800 households have benefited from the installation of energy efficiency measures through warm homes and levy schemes, and that's led to an investment of over 2 million in rural households. Um, almost 6,000 households have been issued with various pieces of equipment and advice from Home Safety Check. 451 people have received additional welfare benefits from 505 successful claims. Um, almost 1,000 people have registered with um, their rural community transport provider. 
440 households have received a smart pass, 477 boiler replacement applications um, have been claimed, more people have availed of services from occupational therapists, social services, and all those um, are all tremendous benefits for rural areas and it really shows, hi highlights the, the need for Mara in rural communities and the need for us to do more of it. I'm certainly um, for in, in designing um, our approach to the 15-16 budget year, the work around tackling poverty and tackling isolation is something that's a priority for me and will continue to be. And doing projects such as Mara, which is um, my department working alongside the public health agency, I believe is of tremendous value and something that we all should prioritise in going forward and making sure there's um, sufficient funding to be able to take it forward. Call Mr. Sean Rogers. <coughs> Speaker, and thanks, Minister, for your answer. And, and just to follow on from that, and I would certainly commend the work of Mara in the South Down constituency. And, but just taking your last answer, and considering that the project is delivered by the Public Health Agency, could you outline the discussions and ongoing engagement you have with the, with the Minister of Health to ensure the continuing success of the Mara project? Um, well, I'm very, I mean, I'm very pleased, and I can give a confirmation to the House that. Um, through all those discussions at ministerial level, um, both my department and um, the public health agency through the Department of Health have agreed to fund this project in 15-16, so there's no doubt of the project going forward. There is confirmation there. Um, for all the reasons that I've outlined, there's obviously um, tremendous benefits to be got from the programme, so I'm delighted that we've been able to secure that um, delivery. And as I said, the most effective um, delivery nature of this is the fact that we've got 13 lead community-based organisations that are actually on the ground delivering the project, and, and I want to see more of that. Well, Ms. Katrina Ruan. Uh, question number eight. My Chief Veterinary Officer began the formal process of applying to the European Commission for officially brucellosis-free status on the 2nd of March 2015. I would hope that we can have our OBF status granted later this year. That would mean that the whole island of Ireland will be recognised as being entirely free of the disease. This represents fantastic news for our dairy and beef farmers. Achieving OBF status would allow us to proportionately and progressively reduce our existing control measures, such as annual testing and pre-movement testing. The brucellosis eradication programme is currently estimated to cost approximately £8 million per year to taxpayers and £7 million per year in compliance costs to farmers. Relaxing the testing regime for brucellosis would therefore result in substantial savings for both livestock farmers and taxpayers in reduced administration and sampling costs. This is now the opportune time to review our existing control measures. On the 6th of March 2015, I've launched a public consultation seeking views on our future testing regime and how we can begin to implement a reduction in our control measures. I would urge all cattle farmers and industry representatives to fully engage with us and to submit their replies before the closing date of the 17th of April. However, we must not be complacent, and I would remind farmers of the importance of complying with the current testing um, requirements. It is also vital to continue to report um, <clears throat> any suspicion of disease so that veterinary service can um, follow up with the necessary investigations. Well, Ms. Ruan for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. And I, uh, I'd like to thank the Minister for her answers. And I wonder, would she outline what savings you expect um, to uh, find from reduced testing? Yes, obviously, um, achieving our um, brucellosis free status is going to allow us to introduce proportionate and progressive reductions to the testing regime. So the overall saving, uh, the current cost to the taxpayer are about £8 million per year, but the industry pay about £7 million per year in compliance costs. So that's a big saving to the farming industry, being able to um, come back on, the, on that. Um, there's also the, the added benefit of um, achieving the status right across the island. And then obviously, um, as we look towards export markets, there will be added benefits there for industry in terms of us being able to actually um, achieve new markets and obviously the knock-on benefit then that that will have in terms of income for farmers. So it's an all-round um, win situation for the farming industry and something that I think that if the farming industry continue to work with the department, we'll be able to um, turn around into a very, very positive development indeed. Order. That ends the period for listed questions. We will now move on to topical questions. Members listed at topical questions 1 and 8 have withdrawn their names. I now call Mr Roy Beggs. Uh, in a recent announcement, it has been disclosed that some €25 million Euro has been invested in a new dairy technology uh, centre at the Limerick, the Limerick University. Uh, a collaboration 
of both industry and researchers. Can the Minister advise us what has actually happened in Northern Ireland under her leadership? There's quite a lot of work. It's a very broad question, but there's quite a lot of work goes on um, in terms of supporting the dairy sector. Um, we have our own um, work that goes on at AFPE. We have um, <coughs> our own work that goes on with the dairy industry through our CAFRI advisors. There's ongoing our discussions with farmers around um, managing their efficiency, around trying to assist farmers around technology transfer. Um, so it's a very broad question. Maybe as a member, I want to be more specific, but there's quite a lot of work goes on in assisting the dairy sector to be able to, be able to expand and grow and to reach into new markets. Mr. Beggs, for supplementary. In the Republic of Ireland, there's a very clear ambition to significantly increase the dairy sector uh, and to, to invest in practical research that will enable that to happen and rewards both to come to both the producer and to the manufacturing process industry. Can the Minister give us a figure of what has been invested in Northern Ireland and how it's been coordinated? I don't have that figure with me, but I'm very happy to provide the member with, the, um, with a figure if we have it. But we, we, we very clearly have an ambition also for the dairy sector, and it's very clearly set out in the going for growth strategy, the economic strategy for growth in the agri-food sector. And that's right across the board, and that includes everything from finding new markets around trying to assist farm businesses um, around efficiency. And we have an avenue to do that through the farm business improvement scheme, which will um, work with the industry around their needs and, and the department then being able to assist them with grant aid. And wherever that may be for um, parlours or for whatever, whatever the, the industry identifies as their need. So there's quite a lot of work, but I'll try and um, get a figure in terms of investment because there is quite significant investment that happens. I just don't have those figures to hand. Well, Mr. Edwin Poots. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, in relation to AFPE, uh, what she thinks the ability of the organisation uh, will be to engage in research uh, in the coming years? Well, AFPE do a significant body of work for the department and, and will continue to do so. Um, I can't have the right figure with me, but I think it's somewhere in the region of about £46 million is their current portfolio with the department around research and development. And that's right across all the different sectors, and that will continue to be the case in the time ahead. We're obviously faced with a very difficult budget situation, given the cuts to the Black Grant from the Tory government, and it's putting us all in a difficult position. I'm working with AFPE around what are our current needs, what are our future needs, and we'll continue to work our way through pro that process as part of the budget process. Mr. Pooch, for a supplementary. Yeah, could I ask the Minister why he has <coughs> disproportionately slashed the AFPE budget by more than twice uh, of everybody else's cuts, um, in fact, close to 30 per cent, which is going to lead to 400 job losses, uh, including the closure of Cross Nacrevi, uh, the OMA facility, and a significant reduction in the services conducted at Hillsborough? Well, I haven't disproportionately affected AFPE's budget. As I said, I'm working my way through the AFPE budget with their board. And we will continue to work our way through that. We are in a difficult economic climate, again, because of the, the cuts to the block grant from the Tories. So I will work my way through AFB, but let's not forget, or let's not move away from the fact that AFB do receive significant funding from the department to do key research and development work, and will continue to hold that portfolio of work over the next number of years. There are challenges for AFB, financial challenges for AFB, given for, for a combination of reasons, not least maybe the private sector work, the EU money that they're drawing down. So I've set them challenges, challenges which I'm quite sure they'll be able to rise to, particularly around attracting additional EU investment. So there are challenges for AFPI like there are challenges for every other executive department here, and I'll continue to work my way through them. But as I said, AFPI do hold a significant body of work. They do key work in terms of research and development, and I want to continue to work with them to be able to support the local industry. Mr. Cathal Boyle. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. I uh, could I thank the Minister for her assistance recently with a local uh, producer who is having difficulties um, attaining board via accreditation. Is the Minister aware of any other producers having difficulties? Gormie Nogan. Well, I thank the member for bringing that issue to my attention. And, um, after we learned that that, that individual was having um, difficulties in terms of securing the board via inspections and accreditation, um, the department got involved, as the, as the member is aware. And, um, we've actually official level have met with Board Bay to discuss their quality assurance schemes and I now understand that the application is being processed so I am delighted that obviously there has been some progress in terms of, of that issue. <coughs> Mr Boylan for supplementary. Um, I thank the Minister for her answer but could, the minister, uh, could I ask the Minister what actions she has taken to, to ensure that uh, there are no bar barriers to 
all island trade. Um, yes, yeah, so removing barriers to all island trade is something that obviously is a regular discussion item between myself and Simon Coveney, and um, obviously um, we're working very closely in terms of um, all island animal health and welfare, so we're able to achieve. Um, the same disease status right across the island. We very much deploy the Fortress Ireland approach when it comes to disease um, control, and that's something that's obviously of tremendous benefit to the industry. I will um, continue to work with Simon Coveney in terms of removing all barriers that exist to trade, because there are opportunities which we can exploit as an island in terms of um, reaching new markets, and there are benefits to be got for all. I think with we'll continued working together, so I can assure the member that. Um, I will continue to do all I can to remove any barriers that there are to all island trade. Mr. Tom Elliott. Hey, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I uh, wonder, given that there is new regulations in the use of pesticides and spraying for farmers, would the, the Minister consider allowing some of that training to be carried out for those farmers in the west of the province, namely uh, in and around Fermanagh? Because the only training facilities uh, at the minute is at Greenmount College. Yes, and actually, it's an issue that um, a farmer raised with me at a public meeting I did in Fermanagh recently, and I'm, I've said that I'll give an undertaking to him, as I will to you, that um, we're trying to see if it's possible we can have, have courses in the West too to make sure that there's proper access for everybody. Mr. Elliott, for a supplementary. Uh, th thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the, the Minister for that uh, assurance. Hopefully, it, it is in the west of the province and not somewhere cent in the centre of the province. But would the Minister also consider maybe providing financial support to uh, independent trainers uh, who can provide this outside of the department, whereby it would give a much wider flexibility in the process? Because the department seem to have a monopoly on that training facility. Well, if the department can provide it in house, why would they pay it? For anybody to do it outside of um, the department officials, but it's not something I'd give any consideration to. I will um, inquire um, as to the need or if there is a need for that type of approach, but it's not something that's been flagged up with me. But I, as part of looking at um, the availability of courses, I can take a look at all of that in the room. Colm Eastwood. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for her answers thus far. Um, can I ask her for an update on the decentralisation, proposed decentralisation of her department to Ballykelly, uh, and when we're likely to see that uh, being fulfilled? Yes, um, the update is that um, over the last number of weeks we were up and saw the demolition of some of the existing buildings on the site, and it's full steam ahead um, in terms of um, making the move and making that transition with all our staff. Um, we are. Um, on target, as we've um, said we would be to be in, in early 2017, and I'm delighted with the progress. I meet regularly with the chair of my um, board that's been tasked to take the project forward, and um, we're very content with the approach that's been taken, and um, I suppose there's ongoing work with engaging with staff and making sure that everybody is content and, and, and moving forward, but um, full steam ahead. Great for, for a supplement. Thank the Minister uh, for that answer. Um, can I, ask, can I ask her, uh, subsequent to that, will civil servants from the North West be able to avail of any potential vacancies that will arise from people uh, maybe not wanting to, to, to go to, to Ballykelly, uh, so that far fewer people will have to actually travel uh, the Belfast Road in the mornings? Yes, the member will, will probably have seen in um, the last number of months we've actually published the numbers of um, people who what would be keen to move into, whether that be the headquarters in um, Ballykelly, Fisheries and Down, or um, Rivers Agency or Forest Service in, in Fermanagh and Throne. It clearly showed the number of people that work in public service that want to find a better work life balance. So, um, for me, I was very enthused by the fact that there was so many staff. As part of the, the, the reason that we have a bit of a, a, a lead in period is the fact that we allow staff to make that transition. And as part of those changes, as part of the wider civil service rules, um, there will be opportunities for staff to either move out of DARD or into DARD, which will obviously facilitate um, the staff from the North West that you're talking, to, talking about. Mr. Raymond McCartney. Uh, Gormie, I'm going to prove Lars Cooler, and can I begin by apologising for not being my place in an, an earlier... The end of the session, Mr. McCartney. Oh, sorry, my apologies. Uh, can I ask the Minister, there has been a, obviously a focus in, in recent days around uh, the... the, the Tony McCoy about to re retire. I'm just wondering, would, would, would this be an appropriate time for the Minister to give us an update on the horse racing fund? Yes, um, well, the Department administers the horse racing fund, which is maintained through um, charges on bookmakers and then um, 
it goes towards funding down Patrick and down rail um, race courses. My um, officials have been engaged with stakeholders as part of a review of the charges on bookmakers, which commenced earlier in the year. Um, back in, in March, in early March, my officials met with the horse racing group, which represents the two race courses, to discuss proposals for future funding. And officials have um, also met with the Turf Guardians group, which represents the bookmakers, who agreed to meet directly with um, the horse race, racing group to try and um, find a way forward. Pardon first supplement. I am going to pre Vlas Concord and go on Buegas, Lesh and Eret and Fragerson. Thank you very much, Minister, for your answer. I am just wondering uh, what work will be done, and particularly with the, the, the online bookmaker section, to ensure that they uh, also be part of whatever revenue is raised. Yeah, um, this is a, a contentious issue between um, the online book bookmakers and, and obviously the race course people, and why one um, group has to pay a levy whilst the other one does not. I, I have written to the DSD Minister giving my support to the proposition that online bookmakers should also make a contribution towards um, horse racing here and that this consideration should be given in the ongoing review of the gambling legislation. So there is an opportunity, I think, to, to make things better and also an opportunity to raise um, funds that would allow um, development and investment in both um, Downpatrick and Down Royal race courses. Megan Farrell. Um, can the Minister provide an update on the rollout of the Young Farmers Scheme? Yes, um, we've obviously had um, significant numbers of young people, more than maybe was anticipated, coming forward actually to enrol in the, in the course, the Level 2 Agriculture course, which we're offering um, in Caffrey. 2,500 um, young farmers have come forward, and then on top of that, there will be other, obviously quite a number of young farmers that already have the, the, um, the qualification. I think that shows that clearly that. We're changing the, the profile of farming is certainly changing where there was never this number of young farmers identified before. The the scheme's financed by reserving two percent of Cap Pillar One to provide the top up payment for those eligible. And it's very clear to me because as I'm engaging in a in a series of um, public meetings that the young farmer um, topic is, is certainly the hot topic of the day in terms of cap reform. Um, no matter what public meeting we go into, young farmers' questions continue to um, take over the, the, the questions on, on the night of, of all the public meetings. So um, it's also my intention actually to provide an additional 10 per cent grant aid provision for young farmers as part of the Farm Business Improvement Scheme. <coughs> so I think all these things are going to lead to um, assistance to help keep young people in farming, um, really help them invest in their farming and look at new practices and new ways of doing things. So it's quite a positive time for young farmers. Sharon, first supplement. Maggot, and I thank the Minister for her answers so far. Can I ask how, um, how effective the Minister feels that the CAFRI course has been in preparing young farmers for that level 2 qualification? Yeah, it's certainly been very effective because um, quite a number of young people are now involved in a DARD CAFRI run course which, who have never maybe engaged in um, the educational opportunities that have been there in the past. So for me, running the courses have actually opened up a whole new um, number of young farmers to, to what we provide. The course, which was run over one evening a week, over 20 weeks, <coughs> has been really successful with a very low drop-off rate. And having been out and actually visited um, one of the classes on an evening, certainly that um, it was great to see that young farmers were enthused and were energised by what um, they were learning. And also, I was delighted to, to see that 10% um, of the um, young people, young farmers that have enrolled in the courses, were, were female, which is again. Um, a number of young um, farmers, which has never been younger of young female farmers, which has never been seen before. Mr. Paul Frey. Mr. Deputy, uh, Principal Speaker, can I ask the, the Minister around the cap reform and the regulations around land? Uh, there seems to be this disparity and discrimination against potato growers with regards to the availability of land, because of course there has to be crop rotation when growing potatoes. Is this a, a, an issue that the Minister has been able to deal with and resolve? Yes, I am aware of the issue. It's not, there's certainly no attempt from the department to discriminate against um, potato growers. It's the issue has ar arisen when, when um, landowners are perhaps going to speculate and maybe try to get an income um, and then are not letting their land to potato growers. We've set out clearly in, in, in an attempt to try and address the issue because, again, this is something that comes up quite frequently in public meetings. Um, we set out um, a Q&A for potato growers, which is on the website, and it maybe would be useful to refer to that if farmers um, contact you individually. Basically, 
the advice that we're setting out because um, the Commission are being um, steadfast in, in what they have set out. So the position that we're, or the best advice and the easiest option, I think, for potato growers is that they would establish entitlements in the first year and then they may be rented back to the, the landowner, sold back to the landowner um, in the following year. So I think that any farm, potato farmer who finds himself in difficulties, I would encourage them to seek advice. Um, we're trying to provide as much clarity as possible to allow them to um, take the best decisions. And I also would discourage anybody that's trying to keep land and who are not genuine farmers from, from doing so, because the department's going to be very robust in terms of how we decide who, um, who is a genuine farmer, and we'll certainly be um, pushing for strong evidence to say that you're actually engaged in farming. Order, time is up. We must not